Ladies and gents, what's your reaction? This is was the YF-23 superior to F-22 by Channel Australian Military Aviation History. Yeah, I've watched one or two videos from this channel. Uh, you know, like uh, when it comes to like YF-23 and F-22, I've seen many, many videos on it, and yeah, it's always like comes down to like what was more important at the time and not trusting the process of Northrop at the time. Even though YF-23 had a lot of elements that made it like a bit more advanced than F-22. But F-22 was just right for what it was, right? I'm mean, sure you could say like uh, there was probably some like back scratching or something in like lobbying and things that could be played. We can never know. But most people like anybody knows anything about the military usually always say like F-22 was the right answer. Right, for whatever it did, it was perfect for that. Y-23, yeah, like, uh, you know, a lot of elements of that were, like, really great, right? Some things the F-22 doesn't have. But, yeah, I'm pretty sure, like, Japan is making what a Y-23 would have been or something, right? I think they gave contract to Northrop. I think that's the case, right? Was it fifth, is it fifth generation, sixth generation? I don't know. But they're making that. But this video is going to be interesting. So let's watch this one. Remember, we'll flag my reaction to front subscribe so that way I know which type of videos to react to more. If you haven't seen other reactions I did about F22 and things, check out the link in the description or in the end of the video end card. And let's do it. In our previous videos, we have looked at several experimental US aircraft pushing aeronautical limits but never saw service. The F 15 stole MTD, the F 16 XL, and the F 18 Harv, to name a few. But there is one experimental aircraft that stands out above all the others for its cutting-edge design. The F-22 Raptor is often credited as the most capable fighter aircraft today. Although it remains largely classified in its abilities, the Air Force considers it their top-of-the-line fighter for air superiority. However, as many are aware, the F-22 was not the only fighter to compete for the position it now holds. In 1990, another fifth-gen fighter, the Northrop YF-23, was also proposed. Today, many consider it an equal, and in some cases a superior design, to the F-22. The history of the Northrop YF-23 dates back to 1981. The Air Force had released a request for information, or RFI, to some of the top aircraft companies. Seven responded, and over the following months, many proposals, 19 in all, were presented. These varied greatly in design and predicted capability. The Air Force were after a design that was stealthy, highly agile, with superior radar, avionics, and the ability to super-cruise, that is, to sustain supersonic flight without using afterburner. In 1986, the two winners of the initial program were announced, Lockheed with its YF-22 design and Northrop with its YF-23 design. Rather than sending the other five companies home, the prime contract... The super cruise thing is like really insane when you really think about it because after bonus, you can't use that all the time, right? Very specific times you can use after bonus. Now, the scenarios might be rare, but imagine if there's a scenario where you have to go toe to toe with something that has super cruise, something does not. Sure, you have like higher speed because you have after bonus. But that's like using nitros from like racing car or something. Well, that super cruise thing can just achieve that speed all the time right so that would be like really different animal if you're trying to like catch up to it fight it it would be completely different but yeah the whole point of that is to achieve stealth right after after bonus basically would kill off stealth but well, super cruise is the main reason so stealth is still there right actors were given the opportunity to partner with one of them lockheed chose boeing while northrop chose mcdonnell douglas over the next four years, both Lockheed and Northrop would have the opportunity to develop their concepts into working designs. This would be part of the advanced tactical fighter competition. Whatever they developed would be judged against the competing demonstrator, and the winner would have their aircraft become the Air Force's preeminent air superiority fighter. Unlike the Lockheed YF-22 design, which put much emphasis on thrust vectoring, the Northrop YF-23 would use no such technology. Northrop engineers believed that thrust vectoring benefits could be achieved through other means and that thrust vectoring nozzles would add too much weight to the airframe. Rather, the aircraft would use single expansion ramp nozzles, or CERNs. Thrust from these engines flow through troughs lined with transpiration-cooled tiles. 
This method, similar to that used on the B-2 bomber, dissipates heat, thus reducing infrared image and lowering that chance of an IR missile lock. The unique shape of the CERN nozzle also hinders ground-launched IR missiles from achieving lock. Yeah, Northrop's ability, basically that technology, which they have in B-2 and obviously B-21 now, right? Uh, right, B-21, yeah. Uh, basically dissipating heat, so there is so much of heat signature coming from like behind or something. So missiles can lock on that accurately and like they would not de be detectable many things. So stealth is just even better, right? Here's why F-22 does any of that. So why F-23 would have been better if, if it was made by Northrop like that, right? But yeah, as we've seen, it had many other problems as well. But yeah, that would have been cool, right? The heat dissipating, uh, you know, feature. The overall airframe shape itself was also unique. Diamond-shaped wings and a V-tail provided better stealth capabilities without negating aerodynamic performance. It also made it lighter and faster than the F-22, although the latter point remains a matter of debate. Two test aircraft were produced, nicknamed Grey Ghost or PAV-1 and Spider or PAV-2. Is it just me, but look at how cold they look. I mean, not that F-22 is not cold, but this is just like, you know, the NGAD, we saw that, we see the diagrams, so it just looks like a triangle or like a diamond shape, basically, even more than this, right? I mean, the more techno, you know, like material science gets better and better. Of course, we're gonna get at that point, right? Where we can make shapes like that to really stealth out things and basically make it even better because technology can like even things out. Two different engines would be used. One would use the Pratt & Whitney YF-119 and the other would use the General Electric YF-120. Both the YF-22 and the YF-23 prototypes were almost equally matched. Both had similar engine performance of 35,000 pounds, top speeds of Mach 2.2 and similar combat operating ranges. However, there were some differences. For instance, the YF-23 was a lighter aircraft and its maximum range could extend out to 4,800 kilometers, whilst the production F-22 had a range of 3,200 kilometers. The YF-23's airframe design is said to have had a near-invisible radar cross-section, matching the stealth abilities of the B-2 bomber. It could be argued that it had superior stealth capabilities compared to the F-22, offering unique possibilities for a stealthy aircraft. In terms of speed, the airframe demonstrated excellent performance when flying transonic. In modern Beyond Visual Range Engagements, or BVR, such capability is important, particularly at higher altitudes. See, the thing with this Y-23 is that those back wings, right, V wings, can really try to flatten out if going in straight speed and you don't need like much uh, like turning. And that would make it even more stealthier, basically how bo B-2 bombers and things are. Pretty sure F-22 can't do that. And this wing does move, we just saw it. So yeah, maybe that would have been better in stealth. Because if you're trying to go from point A to point B, right? Uh, trying to be stealthy, you're not trying to move around that much. You're probably going in straight lines. So those things can come in handy. Like your stealth would go higher, right? Not that F-22 needs any more stealth. It's like insanely stealthy already. The characteristics of the airframe allowed for super cruise up to Mach 1.6, that is, without the need for afterburner. This capability would have allowed for better BVR performance for longer periods of time, without burning through massive amounts of fuel, while remaining stealthy. With afterburners engaged, however, the aircraft was said to achieve a top speed of Mach 2.6, slightly faster than the F-22's Mach 2.2, although there is no publicly available information to verify the top speeds of either aircraft. In terms of agility, the F-22 ultimately won the competition. Northrop's decision to remove thrust vectoring came at a cost, and this was reduced performance at lower speeds. Although the YF-23 was lighter, at near stalling speeds, thrust vectoring could do what the airframe of the YF-23 could not, and that was to generate the necessary movements for maneuvering. A common source of data about the YF-23's capability comes from test pilot Paul Metz. I mean, obviously, thrust vectoring would give you that level of agility, right? I mean, this might be a bit off, but this is similar how, like, four-wheel steering works at a higher speed, like, uh, Porsche 918 and things like that have, basically. Kind of, if you, you know, like, it can really give you the edge with the agility and things, right? That's why I'm pretty sure F-35 has the thrust vectoring like that as well, so it makes sense. 
But I'm pretty sure, like, I remember one of the videos, like, that, you know, so basically Northrop could have gone more extreme with the demonstration. They didn't. And that probably cost cost them. Because if you're trying to demonstrate to the whatever Congress or Senate or whatever, like, look at our thing, or military, look at our thing, how good it is. You, try, you need to go all out, which probably, uh, you know, like, F-22 did, but F-23 didn't. That could have been the issue. A Vietnam veteran, Metz would be selected to fly the YF-23 during the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program. Here he got to see just how capable the aircraft was, albeit as a demonstrator. Later he would fly a pre-production variant of the F-22, which by then had been commissioned following its victory in the Advanced Tactical Fighter competition. Having flown both aircraft, Metz offers important insight into just how good the YF-23 was. In terms of performance, he remembers the YF-23 as being particularly capable in high AOA situations, operating at trimmed angles of attack up to 60 degrees. The F-22 could also achieve this, albeit with the aid of thrust vectoring. He concluded that the YF-23 not only matched, but potentially outperformed the F-22. This judgment came after Metz began flying pre-production models of the F-22, which would have been more advanced than the demonstrator used in the competition. The exact reasons for his judgment remain unclear, and we can only assume classified data about both aircraft played a part in his final verdict. According to Metz, the Northrop engineers were perhaps the best in the business, but they were engineers, and presented everything in technical terms, as you'd expect engineers to do. In contrast, Lockheed knew that marketing and lasting impressions were important, potential purchasers may not be technically astute. Thus, a focus was placed on showmanship directed toward acquisition decision-makers. The competition would technically begin with the rollout of the two competing airframes. Northrop would present the YF-23 for the first time at a ceremony at Edwards Air Force Base on June 22, 1990. This first YF-23, Grey Ghost or PAV-1, would undergo a series of ground tests over the following weeks, before taking to the sky for the first time on August 27. Paul Metz recalls that the flight was good, the aircraft was solid, and the F-16 escort plane had to use afterburner to keep up with his Pratt & Whitney-powered aircraft. The day after this successful test, Lockheed rolled out their YF-22 prototype. Speeding up production, Northrop then approved a mid-air refueling test on the YF-23's fourth flight. Trailing a KC-135, the YF-23 would spend three hours connecting and disconnecting at various speeds, proving it was capable. Flight number five saw the first supersonic test. This too proved successful, and by flight number 11, the final pilot checks had been completed. The second aircraft, Spider or PAV-2, would emerge on October 26, 1990. Using the GE engines, test pilot Jim Sandberg would take it for its first flight. However, it was at this point that the Northrop team began experiencing difficulties. On October 30th, 1990, Test pilot Bill Lowe witnessed the outer layer of his windscreen shatter on Grey Ghost while flying at Mach 1.5. Fortunately, the polycarbonate layer remained in place and the aircraft returned safely. Not long after, the same issue occurred on the Spider. This was a major problem. Not only was it a potentially fatal flaw, but any integrity breach to the specially designed windscreens would increase radar cross-section, decreasing its stealth characteristics. PAV2 I was about to say, by this point, they're talking about stealth and like all this shit. So uh, this kind of a, like integrity fail of this kind is like big thing. And like the guy said, like Northrop had the best scientists. Like why did this issue happen then, right? This was like one of those things like even in F-16, F-15, it makes sense. But by this point, like they're like, oh, we're so good. We're trying to do stealth. Shit like this shouldn't happen. But yeah. Whose second flight would also prove troublesome. After taking off, one of the GE engines experienced problems and would not accelerate, and a single engine landing had to be made. During Flight 3, there was an almost fatal incident when a plugged line resulted in the fuel tanks overpressurizing. Luckily, this was picked up before the aircraft climbed too high and a safe landing was achieved. Both PAV-1 and PAV-2 would undergo maintenance to prevent further issues, and for the most part, this appears to have succeeded. Both Grey Ghost and Spider would fly together for the first and only time on November 29, 1990, piloted by Metz and Sandberg over the Mojave Desert. The next day, PAV-1 would be taken for its last flight and then retired. With funding running out as the program neared its end, focus was placed on PAV-2 for the following month. New supercruise capabilities were supposedly tested, with the speed results remaining unreleased to the public. 
things would soon wrap up for PAV-2 as well. On December 18th, PAV-2 would be sent up with Lockheed's YF-22 prototype for a 15-minute photo shoot. This would be the only time the two aircraft would fly together. Later that same day, test pilot Ron Johnson would take the aircraft on its final flight, a two-hour test mission. For the months following this, both YF-23s would remain on the ground. Except for a number of taxi runs to keep the aircraft in flyable condition, they would never be used again. The end of the YF-23 program would come on April 23, 1991, with the YF-22 becoming the aircraft of choice. The Air Force contracted Lockheed to produce the F-22 Raptor, establishing the aircraft as the premier American fighter. The F-22 was using proven design principles and technologies which had been integrated into other designs, very different to the more radical YF-22. Yeah, I think the problem was all those failures, <laughs> McDonnell Douglas, and all these issues were the, probably the reason why they went with the Lockheed, right? So yeah, Northrop might have been overpowered by like who they chose to partner up with, basically. Who they chose to partner up with and yeah, all this shit, all this failure, probably like they, they're like, okay, safe bed is after you do. 23. That may have been perceived as too much of a risk. After all, this was to be the top line fighter and risk mitigation would have been a high priority. The YF-23 also lacked a demonstration-ready weapons bay, not being a requirement for the competition. This omission may have raised concerns about the concept's reliability and stealth capability. Thus, both YF-23s were put into storage and later sent to museums. Other offshoots from the program, including schematics for the production F-23 variant and the proposed Navy variant... What was that guy on, like, what was that, like, <laughs> those stupid things, what is it called? Skaters something. NATF-23 were shelved. Today, the YF-23 remains a legendary aircraft among enthusiasts. Its unique design, cutting-edge technology, and overall ability to hold its own against the F-22, at least on paper, has only added to its reputation. No doubt, hypothetical comparisons between the F-22 and the YF-23 will continue for years to come, or at least until all available data is released. The YF-23 may not have been as polished as the F-22, but it remains, according to the only pilot to have tested both aircraft, a formidable dogfighter with great potential. Yeah, I think when they make a uh, next generation, air dominant sixth generation, whatever, then probably they'll release all the documents by then. I think that's what they're going to do. But yeah, the people need something. Oh, F-22 shit. For F-23 was much better. The people need this mystique, apparently. But no, I, all those failures. Yes, it had like B-2 bomber style, some technology, which is like awesome. But yeah, F-22 with thrust vector and everything, it was just like, yeah, it was just better. Uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe Y-23 could have been just the right thing to be better, but better by how much margin? Yeah, was it sustainable, right? F-22 is like, uh, you know, something that came before, like continuous one of that. So like maintenance and like all the issue can be, uh, you know, like tackle like that. Whenever you introduce like, you know, really different design and different technology, like it becomes a problem. So F-22 was like the better answer overall. All right, well, if you like, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time.